Thank you, Jean. I appreciate that. And, and, and many of you will recognize this text, Matthew 3, 6, 33, especially one of my favorite texts. Uh, seek ye first, if you do the King James, which is what I memorized growing up in, in my middle, uh, in my early adolescence in the Baptist church. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And um, I love the way in which Peterson, um, you, in the message, sort of unfolds this and opens this up with a little more contextual meaning for us in, in the 20th, 21st century. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Um, if you know, this is Epiphany, right? So today is the first day of our liturgical year, so to speak, for those in, in many Protestant churches all around the country, including our own in the main sanctuary. I don't know what they were doing in the gathering, but in the main sanctuary, in the traditional service, they're reading Matthew 2, 1 through 12, this, the familiar story of the uh, Magi and their trek across the land in search of the, of the baby Jesus. And, and then uh, Herod's attempt to, to stop this movement and kill all the children under two. And, and the drama of this story when they finally find the baby Jesus. And I was sharing this with Charm, you know, about what the wise men brought. And Charm reminded me of that wonderful image when I said, you know, I made a joke and said the wise men, you know, there was one that brought uh, myrrh and one that brought gold. And then the other one they looked and said, what, Frankenstein? And Charm was like, yeah, 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 but you know, the real thing about it is, is that when, when the wise guys left, the wise women came along and brought casseroles, and, and they brought diapers, and they brought hugs, you know, and far more pragmatic, and probably asked for directions, you know, and, and didn't have any problem getting there whatsoever. Um, but but this, this idea of epiphany, so why on epiphany, a traditional Sunday, when we're talking about the uh, revelation of God in the world, am I talking about one of Jesus' seminal teachings that he offered from the Sermon on the Mount when he's teaching the Beatitudes and this whole series of teachings that he offers, uh, one of this being this, this, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added to you. So I want to think with you for the next four weeks this idea of being empty in order to experience life more fully and, um, and to play with epiphany this season of discovery as a, as a vehicle for looking into that more deeply. And, and it was fun because Gene, Gene and uh, former uh, retired clergy from the North Texas Conference, you know, he comes up and he says, can't wait to see how you put this together. <laughs> um, but he, but he, said it with, he said it with affirmation. I want, you to say, I want you to know that because we have fun in here trying to pull all of these various sort of different ideas together and the quotes that are on the back side of the page and, and the text. And then we open up with a song like, like Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. And, and if you're a visitor, you're wondering, for the first time if you're a visitor, you're wondering like, this is not what I expected. Um, or maybe it is. Hopefully it was. A lot, of, a lot of folks come in and first time here and they said, what a breath of fresh air. So it's, for us, it's a chance to explore real life and find the sacred in every moment. That's what epiphany really is. Epiphany really is that moment when the birth of a child made the difference in all the world. When the birth of a child can make the difference in any of our worlds, but this particular birth means something so profound. But it breaks into the ordinary. How does the sacred break into our ordinary all the time? That's, that's kind of what we do here every Sunday, right? We try, to, we try to think about the different ways that happens. So this day in the church year, the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles, which is essentially what that story says. You know, not every gospel has the story. Two of the gospels have it, two of them don't. But, but this, and then of course Paul doesn't talk about it whatsoever, nor do the other writers. This story means something. It's more simply than how the historical Jesus came to be. Whether or not you believe that is a historical story or not isn't really important. In all honesty, it's not. What's important is the truth behind this story, which is that love breaks into the world, that love is present in the world, and that sometimes epiphany really means, are we paying attention? Epiphany means discovery, the first time we realize something we hadn't realized before. And is it happening on any kind of consistent basis? Because what use is there of, of the birth of Jesus being in the world if, in fact, we are not discovering something new? I have this wonderful quote that, uh, that um, I think I put it on here. I hope I did. Yes. Um, it's a Japanese proverb. 
that I love, which is, well, actually, Henry David Thoreau, when any real progress is made, we unlearn and learn anew what we thought we knew before, right? Or my favorite way to say it is like my uncle used to say, he says, you know, we only know what we know, and chances are we don't know that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then, of course, my other favorite one is this Japanese proverb, Nod knowledge is learning something every day, wisdom is, is letting go of something every day. So, Epiphany has always been an important part, more important part of liturgical year for my family than Christmas. Now, Christmas is important, but it's really, if you really get down to it, the birth of Christ, celebrating the birth of Christ, the birth of the Christ child is important, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we have priesters, right? We have the people who come on Christmas and they come on Easter. And why do they do that? Is it just because they're, 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 they just hope to have sort of like a last ticket, you know, somehow to keep that ticket, you know, uh, click so they get it. You know, why come at all? Other than it's a, com a communal tradition, it's a cultural tradition too. But I think there's another reason why. is because we all are longing for something deeper and bigger than us. And sometimes we desperately want it, and, and, and we remind ourselves annually. I think a lot of people come for that. But the real message doesn't happen until discovery. The real message doesn't happen until something opens us up. Something changes us, and that's epiphany. We suddenly have an insight. We suddenly see something. So that time became more important to me and my family, to our two kids, than, than Christmas, even though we love Christmas because we exchange gifts and we have a great family time and that great community time and the beautiful celebration. But it's the, it's the epiphany, the discovery of that new life and love in our midst that seems to be to me what's most important. Um, and so what my family would do is we'd have epiphanal celebrations. And we don't do it as much now as we used to because the boys are growing up. But we, would, we started this when they were very young, when they were, were small, maybe four years old, five years old, six years old. And we did this with our good friends, Chris and Jim Riddlesberger. Some of you all know Jim Riddlesberger, professor of political science, and she was a professor of nursing. And uh, they're members of this church. They've probably taught some of your classes if you've gone to some Sunday school classes. Jim's a political science teacher and very active in the political science commu political community. Um, their kids growing up grew up with our kids. And so they joined in with this tradition, which I think is quite a, a risky venture. Anytime the McDermott's say, you want to join us in something? Um, <laughs> and so we started, I had, because I toured the country as a storyteller, I'm always looking for interesting, curious instruments. So my house is full of these weird things like hurdy-gurdies and theremins. And, and then these lovely instruments, which are called dung chocks or chungpas, they are Tibetan horns. Now, I can't play one for my life. I mean, it takes a lot of breath. <laughs> and, and just blowing it a couple of times, and I'm already dizzy. But I have a clip, and I want to, Justin to play a clip of the Tibetan monks playing this instrument. It's like they're going, that was the wrong note. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, that's, that's enough. <laughs> so that's how they're supposed to sound. Now, they're up at 10,000 feet altitude in doing that. It takes a lot of breath and a lot of practice to get these things, to actually make these notes and to get these overtones, and you're hearing them blow these things. If you, if you look up and, and kind of do some research on what they're, why they do this, why it's a part of every pretty much significant ritual they have, and you're probably wondering, why is he even talking about Tibetan Buddhism, you know, this kind of thing? But what, well, because it, it relates to my story. Um, but... What they're doing is they're, ha they're, they're calling everyone to attention. They're calling everyone to attention. And the low note is to, is to resonate with that low vibration, the very ground of our being, that very essence of our birth that we're not aware of because we're in our mother's womb. But we're no longer aware of it now. But we felt it then. 
We felt everything as low vibration and sustenance. We felt everything as support. So they blow these horns as a way of reminding people. What do you do in your lives to remind you of how deeply connected and embraced we are by life? What do we do regularly to do that? That's epiphany to me. That's reminding us to sort of let go of whatever's keeping us from that in order to be present to what that is. So we celebrated it by taking these horns. I have four of them, and um, one's that's even bigger and one that's much smaller. So we would take these horns as well as some British uh, um, um, hunting horns, you know, little four-foot horns that uh, you would use on a horseback. And, and then what we do is we have a celebration at the house, and we celebrate Epiphany. We mix it with Mardi Gras. We'd have a king's cake, and we'd look for the baby Jesus. And whoever found the baby Jesus in the cake then gets to go and do what, you know, they're the king for the day or the queen for the, for the evening. And we do what they want to do. And usually it's always been something fun, you know. We'll go to Chick-fil-A or we'll go to a movie. Sometimes we've gone to a movie that evening. The, the seven, the six of us, or eight of us. Yeah, the eight of us. And, um, and so, uh, but then what we do on the way to wherever the deal is. Matthew, my youngest, won it like two or three times. And every time he won it, the one thing, we like, you can do anything, Matthew. Anything. What do you want to do? He'd say, I want Biggie Fries. So we go to McDonald's and get Biggie fries and head home. <laughs> but on the way there, and no matter where we were going, we took the minivan. That's what I used to drive for years with my kids. We take the minivan, open up the back end. The boys sat with the seats down while the adults rode up in the front, and they blew the trunk paws out the back <laughs> as we drove around town. We made sure to drive through downtown as people were eating at the restaurants. And we shouted at the top of our lungs to remind people Christmas is one thing, but happy epiphany. <laughs> and hopefully some people went and looked it up instead of just going like, what's wrong with that family? <laughs> and we would shout it all the way to wherever we were going and then wish the people at the counter or wish the people in the movie theater happy epiphany. Nobody usually would ask us what that means, but we would wish it anyway and blow these horns. It, it, this idea of waking up is what I think epiphany is all about. And from the angle of emptiness, I think it's an invitation. When I talk about being empty, the one thing I want to think about in this series is I want us to move away from thinking about some Zen-like state of mindfulness or satori or some kind of idea of non-attachment. I'm, I'm not really talking about that, although that's, that's certainly a helpful thing if, that, and it can, if you find it helpful too. Uh, but I'm not also thinking about some monastic ascetic tradition where it's really about Kairos. I'm not really talking about mindfulness, about being present to the moment that seeks to let go, or, or some austere kind of relationship with the world that is saying we need to let go of everything. We need to live more minimalist. We need to be more sacrificial in giving. That's not what I'm talking about emptiness either. I'm not talking about that sort of idea of, of, um, uh, of, of letting go and letting God. I'm not even thinking in those terms, although that's not bad. I'm not saying, suggesting that we shouldn't do anything like that. Someone came up to me and said, but I have known what it feels like to be empty, right? Or I've known the feeling of emptiness, and I get that. And in a sense, that's what I'm talking about. If you look up the root word of empty, you'll find two root definitions that are so amazing to me. I, I never realized this. I always think of emptying as letting go of something. But the thing we're letting go of is that the root word of what empty is. And you know what that root word is? It is fear. The root word of emptiness actually means the absence of fear. It says leisure and comfort and the absence of fear is emptiness. That's at the root. Now, we've taken it and we've made all sorts of interesting meanings out of emptiness. But even the idea of my life is lacking in something is a fear that continues to control me. 
And so when I want to think about emptiness with you over the next four weeks, as we enter into the season of 2019, and we enter into this continual sort of reality around us, not, just, not, not even just the political or the social reality around us that's a little bit, or maybe a lot of bit, touch and go and anxiety producing for us in all different ways, but even our own lives as we enter into this new year and these expectations we hope for or, or these assumptions we bring to the moment. What I'm really thinking about is how do we learn to let go of fear? One of my, a uh, person that I've come to know over the years um, is, um, I don't need to have my time in front of me. I need to make sure I've got that in front of me. Yes, okay. Um, is, is this woman by the name of Greta Vosper, who's a United Church of Christ minister up in, in uh, Canada, just on the other side of the border in Alberta. And one of the things that she does that we used to do is she used to have a big celebration of the winter solstice. We used to do that on a more regular basis. But we think of this season, of course, as the winter season. Solstice is on the 21st. It's the longest night of the year. And this season, in terms of, 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 of creation spirituality, in terms of having a deeper connection with life around us, is a season of fallowness, right? It's a season of, of everything in sort of um, a, a state of rest, a state of stillness, a dormancy even. So at this time of year, we're really invited to sort of be more present to that, but I see it as more an invitation to take what frightens us and to find ways to rest with that, to live into that in order to set it free. Once we learn to set some of these things free, I think, and many of you know what I'm talking about, we begin to discover what Rumi called the gift that this guest house welcomes when it's open to the discomforts, when it's open to the mysteries, when it's open to the sadness or the challenges, that all of them, in fact, are angels unaware, are possibilities for some new epiphany. And so this, this next four weeks, we're going to explore with what it means to be empty. Um, as we do that, I want us to think about this Winnie the Pooh scene. You know, Christopher Robin is growing up, right? Or he's beginning to figure out what it means to be growing up. He's in the Hundred Acre Wood and he's discovering imagination will play this big role in what it means to be alive. And not the elimination of imagination. I mean, isn't that what A.A. A. Milne is doing in writing such a book that more of us as adults have enjoyed than children, in fact? because it speaks to something we have forgotten to hang on to, which is the willingness to imagine, the willingness to be present to something that's bigger than us, the willingness to let go of fear in order to discover. There's this bravery that, that you sense with someone like Christopher Robin, something that like Brene Brown speaks about when she talks about living fearlessly. She's not talking about bravery in terms of uh, soldiers or in terms of taking massive risk without concern. She's talking about opening up to life, whatever comes, to live into it, to live authentically. The way in which our song by um, Jason Mraz speaks to being who we are, not the facade of fear or anxiety or what we worry about or what comes next, but being who we are at the very ground of our being, the gift of our life that we have, the presence of God at the very ground of who we are, reminding us that that's what we are called to be. And so he comes and he discovers that in Pooh and Piglet, there's really a yin and a yang. And maybe the first step in finding God's kingdom is letting go of our own assumptions enough to discover the fact that we are already there.